Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here for this uh, special installment of the uh, Professor Anthony J. Santoro Business Law Lecture. Um, I want to welcome uh, especially uh, Tony and Pauline's family members uh, who are here with us, and I know you will be joined um, by more later. Thank you for being here. Uh, President Farish, um, members of the university trustees, law school board of directors, faculty, staff, alumni, uh, and particularly our panelists. Um, this lecture series, uh, which is funded by uh, Tony's admirers, and there are many, um, has brought to the law school leaders in business and in government to talk about the gaming industry, to talk about the regulatory uh, environment for startup companies, uh, to talk about disruption in the market for the delivery of legal services, uh, the FCC and consumer protection, the SEC and securities regulation. Um, and for today's lecture, uh, we are joined by a remarkably accomplished group of RW Law alumni whose careers in business and business law have been shaped by Tony and his work. I want to congratulate them on their successes and thank them for taking the time to be with us today to help honor Tony. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome to the podium the man of the hour hours, uh, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, Professor Santoro to say a few words, Tony. Thank you, Michael. I noticed that when you said admirers of Tony Santoro, my entire family started giggling. Um, <laughs> we got to be careful what we say. Seriously, I am absolutely excited to be here. Uh, this. Uh, lecture series was started by an alum, Brian Ali, and his colleagues, and it's just been a wonderful series. But I'm especially proud to be here today because I've got five former students here who are going to give this lecture, and I am deeply appreciative of their taking the time out of their busy schedules to do this. But I will grade them in any event, and we'll <laughs> <laughs> can we revoke their degree? <laughs> Seriously, I don't want to take any time. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us, and I'm looking forward to a spirited panel discussion. Thank you. Hot mic. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Uh, all right, we're going to jump right in so we can figure out who's going to get the Cali on the panel today. <laughs> um, so as much as we know that you all love hearing people's bios, uh, the panel in its infinite wisdom has decided that we'd rather jump right in and skip that portion. You do have the bio of the um, very impressive panel members in front of you if you'd like to read that. But we're actually just going to kick it off with each panel member briefly introducing themselves and if there's any um, fun stories, uh, embarrassing moments, favorite lessons about Tony they'd like to share, we we'll encourage them to do that as well. And can I start down on this, this Corey side of the table? <laughs> sure. Uh, Corey Gilbart, um, currently the chief legal officer of a boutique economic consulting firm that focuses on expert testimony for gender pay equity discrimination cases. Um, Again, enough about me. We're going to start with a little bit of Tony, or Professor Santoni, Santoro, as I say, out of deference. Um, I started my new role a year ago. I walked in. My direct reporting line is to the CFO at the company. Uh, after our first conversation, I realized very quickly I had to go back to my notes from 2006 on business and partnership tax to understand the macro of the company and to understand what was important to my now boss, the CFO. Uh, but I, I want to say just one thing more macro level about the school and Professor Santoro's influence. I think when I think back to my time here and I think of Professor Santoro, I think about being a young school and going into an industry, entering an industry, whether I knew it or not, that, as we discussed earlier, barters a little bit in prestige, almost inordinately. 
And as a young school within the first 10 or so graduating classes, you haven't really built up that network, that market penetration, that history to build upon. And you know, I think it was really important for us, whether we knew or not, to have mentors like Professor Santoro who lended credibility to our pursuits. And I think I can speak particularly on behalf of a lot of the uh, tax LLMs. I mean, I don't know if we'd have such an extensive network at the big four right now if it weren't for Professor Santoro. So I think it's, for me, that's quite important and more so for the community as a whole, I think, to take that exemplar and apply it in our pursuits to kind of better the community, better the network, and further that. Um, it's really going to benefit us all individually, but as a community as a whole. Do I jump in, in or do, yeah. I didn't know if you announced it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Coughlin. Uh, currently, I'm uh, the Dutchess County Controller. It's an elected position, uh, one of uh, seven in New York State. Uh, I'm a little freaked out, I'll be honest right now. Uh, <laughs> it's the first time I've been back to the law school since I graduated in uh, May of uh, 2006. A lot of changes, uh, calling Corey on the phone, uh, dial a friend, like, how did I even get here? What's going on? And uh, uh, the town's gentrified, it's kind of changed. Uh, and, uh, you know, we spend such a critical part of our lives here uh, in the crucible under a lot of stress. And so there's a lot of emotions. Uh, if I get a little kaflimp today, I, hope <laughs> I ask uh, everybody to uh, pardon me. Uh, when I first came here, uh, I had Professor Tights for Civil Procedure, 1L, and scared the living hell out of me every day. <laughs> <laughs> I sat there and prayed every day, don't call me, don't call me, don't call me. Uh, I then had her uh, as a 3L in conflicts, and I'm sure it changed, and she probably was saying, please don't talk today, Coughlin. <laughs> uh, I uh, had extensive business uh, experience uh, working overseas uh, before I decided to become a law student late in life. So I definitely was more interested in the business side of law here. And so it's natural that I acclimated to Professor Santoro. Uh, what an amazing mentor, uh, building upon uh, Corey's thoughts. Uh, though I don't know why he and his lovely wife Pauline would ever let a degenerate like me into their inner circle. Uh, I thank them for that. It's made such a difference in my professional and personal life. Uh, we'll get into a lot of the good stuff to, uh, today to talk about. Uh, but, um, you know, just want to say that uh, my first time in Professor Santoro's class, he announced to everybody that he doesn't believe in uh, bumping up for participation. And being a cocky young kid, I said, well, Professor, then what's my motivation to participate? <laughs> Thinking I had won the argument. And the sparkle in Prof Professor Santoro's eye that we all know well looked at me about a second and said, well, Mr. Coughlin, I reserve the right to bump down. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I should have just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> so, but uh, regardless, uh, I'll pass it on, of course, to you. <laughs> um, um, I'm Elizabeth Cola Giovanni. Uh, I'm a lecturer uh, now at Bentley University teaching um, business law, tax law, um, following in uh, my mentor's footsteps. Um, my weird uh, background, I started as a pre-med major here at the undergrad uh, Roger Williams um, when Professor Santoro was actually President Santoro. Um, and uh, my funny, we well, a couple of weird stories um, <laughs> is uh, I actually, the, this building was just built, uh, dating myself as my undergrad. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I was a junior and I was being inducted um, into the Honor Society and President Santoro came up to me because um, he knew my dad, because <laughs> my dad taught here um, at the uh, math uh, uh, department and he was like, I just wanted to come, up with, to come up to you and say that I'm sure your father is pretty proud and I'm proud of you and this is the president of the university saying this to me as a junior in college um, and I never forgot that. And he, every time I went to events, I would always talk to him and he remembered my name. Um, out of thousands of students in the undergrad, he remembered my name and that just impressed me. Um, and I diverged and instead of going into medicine, I went out to LA and said, I'm gonna go into the film industry. <laughs> Don't know why I did that. Um, and didn't like it and wanted to come back. Well, 
I did like it in a way because I learned business. I was learning um, business law. I was actually working with a lot of lawyers and agents and actually liked it. And I was thinking of going into contract law. And I called him up and I said, I think I'm going to come back home and go to law school. What do you think? And he took me on a tour of the building and got me hooked. Um, and got me hooked on tax. I thought I was going to go contract. And he was like, well, I think you need to take Fed tax. You've got to take Fed tax if you want to go into business. And I was like, ah, oh, as every other student is like, oh, tax. Um, and I took the Fed tax, and I took every tax class he ever taught here afterwards. And so, so he, I'm, I'm trying to at least follow in his footsteps uh, minimally, because <laughs> I could never fill his shoes. He's amazing. All right. Uh, my name's Corey Billado. I am a tax attorney. I mean, that's what I do. So I guess I'm, you know, I followed in his footsteps as a practicing lawyer. I worked at a large law firm of uh, 50 plus lawyers and we did everything, immigration law, tax law, all that stuff. But then I ended up leaving and joining a smaller, I, I don't like to use the word boutique, but it's a boutique tax firm. And one of our other attorneys, Catherine Windsor, who's a student, former student of Professor Santoro, and got her LLM in tax law as well. Uh, but so I moved over to a small firm. There's eight lawyers. That's pretty much all we do. My, Ninety percent of my work is all tax law. It's transactional tax law. I like to tell people I. I help people, they say, well, what do you do? I say, well, I help people avoid paying taxes. I help them to defer taxes, and I help them convert ordinary income to capital gains. And, and so you know, that's what I do. I also do a little bit of tax controversy work, but Catherine runs that department at the firm. That's people who uh, have problems with the IRS, who need help and assistance, and people say, well, why don't you do that anymore? And I say, well, most of those people don't have money. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're not the people I like to work with. But, um, I will say that. <laughs> Are you allowed to say that here? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm not supposed to say that. But, uh, there are no ethics student. credit in this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm out. I've graduated. I will say, I can say that I would not be here today without Professor Santoro because I, when I was about to graduate, he said, I took all his tax courses, every one, there were six of them. He even taught uh, tax stories, which was painful, but we, went, <laughs> it was, we, we made it through. It was a one credit class and everyone said, well, well let's take this. We need, everyone needs a credit to get out of here. And, and so we took, that, we took that class. But then after, I, he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I like tax. He said, well, why don't you get your LLM in tax? So I said, I don't even know what that is. Like, what is that? I didn't know there's such a degree as an LLM in tax. So I ended up doing that. Went to BU in 2007, went full time, and got my master's in tax law. And since then, just have been working in that area. And so I would say my one story, funny story, because uh, about Professor Santoro is we have the, I don't, they still have the auction every year. And so he bids the dinner. And so the group of us, uh, me and Jimmy and a few others bid on it. And we said, we're going to pick you up in a limo. And so we, we went to his house in a limo. And so he's showing us the house. And we're like, this is great. And so then uh, the, the best part was, he opens up the closet and he has a bar in the closet and he says, well, let's drink. And so we all said, okay, here we go. So I, we thought that was the coolest thing that is, a bar in the closet. <laughs> so that's uh, my funny uh, Professor Santoro story. We need to go back. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> no doubt about that. Maybe after Aiden's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I love that tax stories class. I think we spent, we were in a lot of the same uh, classes, uh, actually. I also took, I think, every single class I could, which was at least six of them. <laughs> um, so as I was preparing for this, I was thinking back over all the lessons that I've learned from Professor Santoro. And of course, there are many, many, many substantive uh, lessons. I still have my notes as well. I took them with me from law school through my LLM program, kept building them, still have them through several computers, right? They keep getting transferred over. Um, but also there were a lot of lessons about lawyering and lessons about life as well. Um, some in the classroom, some over glasses of wine at various Italian restaurants throughout uh, Providence as well. 
Um, so uh, I think Tony was the first person who really taught me how to take all the different pieces of what we were learning in other classes, all the different legal knowledge and the skills we were developing, to put that together with the business insight that we needed to have um, and the goals that the clients had to really be a valuable member of that client team. Um, and there are many life lessons along the way as well. Um, I was remembering how when I first uh, started in Tony's classes, uh, I, I learned uh, much more slowly than I'm proud of that I had a terrible poker face when I started in law school because I was having these moments regularly where another student would be speaking and uh, Tony would point to me and say, Ms. Ahern disagrees with you. And I was quiet as a turd <laughs> And I thought not only does he know the Internal Revenue Code um, by heart, he also is telepathic. Um, and it took me a little while to learn that that's not in fact what was happening. And I've worked on that somewhat uh, over time. All right, so let's uh, dig into some of the questions that we have from our panelists. So first we want to hear about uh, what are the advantages of a legal education and what is it about the way we're trained to think as lawyers and as business lawyers that really translates and uh, gives us a professional advantage. So we're going to ask um, Corey and Corey to give us some insight into that topic. Sure, I can jump in. Um, I think it's something to be careful of when you're talking about the skill set you're learning as an attorney in law school. Um, you're learning a lot. You're getting a more macro view of a business, um, but you're getting it in the academic sense. So I think one way to view this question is to talk about what aren't you learning and what you should be asking now as you pursue these classes, whether it be business partnership tax, biz org, that sort of thing. Um, for me, coming out of college, I went straight to law school. I lack business experience. Um, it's easy to go into an organization with all of the academic background, but not have any of the functional. Um, so I think if you can harness the academic, the intellectual side, and be inquisitive on your first day, be open, um, you have a much more pragmatic, holistic view of a company. Um, for instance, when I go in, I've never been in-house per se with a company. I've been on secondment at a few, but I wasn't a per se corporate attorney in-house. Um, my first role being in the last year, I knew exactly where to step in, what questions to ask, and that adds a lot of validity to your position from the start, especially when you're a corporate attorney. <laughs> you are a non-revenue generating attorney, you're a cost center. <laughs> so you have to show, you understand what the business is doing, what is their end goal. You have to achieve their objectives. So I think bringing that all together, what you're learning a lot in law school is core business skills, risk management, critical reasoning. Um, I noted corporate structure being a huge one. I mean, we're a small organization. We have about 90 full-time employees. Um, Revenue-wise, we have big corporate issues. Um, so it's, for me, it's how do you measure that between the legal knowledge I have, but also respecting the business and how do I integrate with the business? And I think if you attend these classes, you have one piece, ask the questions and put it together as a whole by the time you get out of here and you'll, you'll understand how to navigate through the system as you go. I think that what I learned as a lawyer that I took, uh, as a law student that I took af out from here, is it really teaches you how to ask questions of your clients because most of your clients don't tell you everything. A lot of times they tell you very little. And so you really have to be able to ask probing questions about uh, what they're trying to accomplish, gathering information, pulling it out of them. Because sometimes, and I always tell my clients, I say, look, what you think may not be important may be important. And so you got to tell me everything. And so it's, it's the process of asking those questions, making sure you're getting the information you need. And that was critical learning that in Professor Santoro's classes, particularly as a I mean, I, transactional tax lawyer. Most people are saying, oh, I don't want to pay taxes. I mean, so that's what I do. I tell, I've got to figure out what they're trying to accomplish and how can we uh, eliminate taxes accomplishing what they want to accomplish because sometimes you, most of the time you can figure it out if you have the right information but it's just getting that out of the client and I worked for three years before going to law school I worked in the financial services world so I I didn't come into law school right out of college and so I kind of worked I worked with business owners before and that's why I gravitated towards the transactional side 
Uh, also, I clerked in a litigation firm and couldn't stand it. So I, I went that direction and thankfully, we had someone like Professor Santoro who taught all those tax courses because without that, I, prob I wouldn't have gone to BU and got my master's or I wouldn't have been able to wave out of classes or learn from him and understand what people are looking to accomplish as a business owner. And you come to, you, you get clients in all different phases of their lives. They could be starting up, they could be in the middle of their, their lives operating their business, or it could be their exit planning. And, and so understanding what they're looking for, what they're trying to accomplish, knowing the questions you need to ask and kind of digging into it and, and prying that information was out of them is critical. And you learn all that as a law student in all the classes, not just uh, the tax courses. Yeah, if I can jump back in, I think that there's a theme developing there. We're focused a lot on objective and taking that holistic view of whatever situation you're in. Um, it sounds intuitive, but it really is a core part of kind of the Socratic method is being inquisitive, understanding, empathy, kind of emotional intelligence. So I think that's important to focus on, on the soft skills you're learning in law school. Uh, and I just I wanted to make that point and bring it together. I think it was well said by Corey. I didn't say which Corey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the business startup clinic that I run, we work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. And I have a friend from my class who uh, is a lawyer but also runs a very thriving real estate business. And I, I put a question to her that I hear from a lot of students who are aware that sometimes lawyers will pr pursue an entrepreneurial path, whether it's something outside of the law or we have a lot of uh, discussions about how being an attorney is actually is being an entrepreneur, whether or not you're in a firm. Uh, and that question that I hear is, is the way we're trained to think as lawyers, the way we identify risk, mean maybe we're not a good match for entrepreneurship because we're constantly worried about that risk and that's a big part that you have to embrace if you're going to be an entrepreneur. And I love her answer that no, you should be less intimidated. It's actually a wonderful match because you're going to always see these risks coming that no one else is able to. Mm -hmm. Uh, to identify. So talking about alternative career paths, um, what types of paths do you think are a good fit for law grads, maybe working in some of your own um, experiences, especially those uh, law grads that are focused in business law, and we're going to ask um, Jim and Liz to chime in on this topic. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, I've always been a weird, eclectic person, so um, I got my LLM after, right after law school um, with Santoro's <laughs> encouragement. Um, we, actually a bunch of us did, about four or five of us um, right from our JD went to BU to get the LLM and the LLM kind of teaches you which tax because you know tax in and of itself there are niches within tax and even within those tax niches are more niches and I went even I went further down the rabbit hole I went into international tax law and then I even went further down the rabbit hole and went into corporate international tax law um, and I went the accounting firm route I didn't do uh, the traditional law firm route and went to EY, um, went to Ernst & Young uh, up, up in Boston right away, right after the LLM. And I worked there for a few years. I actually kind of um, slowly worked my way out <laughs> of um, uh, accounting firms. Um, but what I found there is that there's a great need for lawyers in accounting firms. In fact, especially with the whole Arthur Anderson thing, they, they know they need them. Um, but there's this kind of, especially when it comes to tax, there's kind of this um, banter between tax attorneys being there and tax accountants being there. Because tax accountants don't understand law and lawyers can't really speak accounting. So there was, there's this constant kind of bump in your heads all the time. And there's always, you, you try and find that middle ground. Um, and my weirdness was I worked in accounting firms for about six years um, and then moved on to adjunct teaching and now teaching full time. And I actually have the best of both worlds because I actually have business students now. So being at Bentley, they're all business. And they come in with the business mindset. So they're expecting facts, figures, and they're, they want to be right on there. And when I start teaching tax law, and having to teach them code and having them to understand how to 
really break apart the code and analyze, that's a process in and of itself. And I think lawyers have that advantage in that they can look at the code and know how to read it and know how to break it down and know how to make an analysis off of it, whereas people coming in from the business side just want the answer. And so I think there needs to be both. I mean, you need to, you need to have the law degree to understand where they're coming from as well. Um, and then also in my consulting practice, bringing up entre entrepreneurship, um, one thing that Bentley does encourage, which I really like, is they want a lot of their lecturers to be in the world, be consultants or be tax attorneys, um, because they still want us to bring in what's really going on. They want us to be fresh, they want us to know what's going on in the law, and they want us to bring that to our classes. And so now that I have, my, I have a small consulting practice on the side, um, which I like because I don't have to do tax returns anymore, um, which I hated doing in the accounting firms. Um, and I can, I can sit down you know, with my clients and really say, okay, let's, let's walk through this and let's see what you really want out of this. Um, what do you want? And I do small business um, and, and high net worth individuals because they really kind of know where they want to be in 10 years. And so that's kind of working with them, which is really great. But I mean, there is risk. I mean, I got the first year out, I was scared to death because I knew the risk. I knew about liabilities. I knew that they could sue me at any moment and I had to be on my game. But at the same time, right, I knew those risks and so I was ready for them at every, at every step, or hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I, um... <clears throat> When I was graduating, I sent out a boatload of resumes and was very shocked when I didn't get a response back from a single one. Uh, we all come into law school with a romantic notion that, uh, you know, we're going to be in that law firm and work your way up and someday you're arguing that amazing case, you're getting the, uh, the, the uh, corner office, the law partnership and all that sort of stuff. The reality is it's only for a select few. And the realistic aspect is uh, you're taking the bar. You don't have a job. I passed the New York in the mass bar, and uh, so I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm on the different websites and stuff, and I was so clueless and naive. I didn't even understand what a contract attorney was. I thought it was for an attorney that wants to do contracts. <laughs> and I didn't realize it's because you just, you know, are getting taken in for a short time in a firm for a particular project. Eventually, I reached out to somebody and said, what the hell is this contract stuff? Because uh, Joe Farside was doing, a few other people were, and I couldn't figure out what, what I was missing. Uh, so I got taken in by a law firm in New York City and soon afterwards uh, I got on the business side of discovery which is uh, you know something that maybe a lot of attorneys don't realize uh, there's the nuts and bolts of doing law and then there's the operational side logistics and management <coughs> of attorneys and the business process of law firms and it's something that maybe we don't stress in law schools because we're so focused on the love of the law and all this romantic notions of I'm going to be doing this and law firms need business people to run operations to stay successful and make money because that's really I wouldn't say what we're all here for but definitely what I'm thinking and uh, so I ended up running at one point uh, contract attorneys I had 75 contract attorneys in a room and my job was to run discovery for a multi million dollar a lawsuit. Uh, we were going through two million uh, pages of documents and pairing things together and you got to keep people focused in a room. What's our goal today? What are we looking for? Motivating people uh, and then tying it in with what the you know senior you know associate that I got to interface with writing memos uh, on how we're going to you know pair this group of documents to this particular motion which has a deadline on this date and you're running you know Microsoft project because we got a deadline coming up and I got to make sure that we find the right document that makes sure this thing has some value and way when we go in front of the uh, the judge um, I found that fascinating only because that's a lot of stuff I had done previous in my life uh, was I disappointed that I wasn't a practicing attorney? Yeah, maybe initially, you know, well, what are you going to say to people? I don't know, what do you tell your parents when you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, shit, I'm not actually practicing law. What the hell are you paying the money for? You know, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but were, was it exciting? Was it something that I, you get value from? Uh, there's a lot of aspects of the legal world that doesn't deal with practicing law. And uh, it's something that, you know, I would say when we're talking in this topic right here about alternative paths to law firms or legal work, 
is something to think about. Uh, definitely, as Key said, you know, entrepreneurship. Uh, Bentley has the MBA program, which my sister uh, went to. Uh, being in a legal mind and having your own business, wow, you can cut a lot of corners on legal needs. Uh, you know, uh, there's so much open to any attorney who goes through the crucible of law, and especially in this great you know, university that I've been so proud to be part of and associated with, but the business thinking, the logic and reason over emotion, but not confusing emotion with passion, because you must be passionate about what you do, but you can't let emotion cloud your legal thinking. There's so many ways you can apply that in so many aspects of life, so many different career paths, because everybody at the end of the day, whether you're just, you can just go to work for a, a company, but they value the logic and reason that we learned here. And you, of course, get promoted quickly. They, they know they can rely on you. You're already thinking, like you said, risk assessment, liability. Did somebody forget that? Do we even have a procurement pro policy? Legit? Are we even an appropriation law violated? There's so many things. Uh, now, as a, you know, I kind of back-ended out of New York City because I wanted to start a family with my wife and I didn't want to have to do a two-hour commute each way to the city and then sit in, you know, for 12 hours in a law firm or 15 hours. Uh, how am I getting out of my law firm in New York City? And I kind of fell into the comptroller uh, world here in New, York, in New York State, in Dutchess County. But I was able to bring a, a very interesting perspective. A uh, hundred million dollars of county uh, funds are paid through contract payments. Uh, that's all clauses. Is that a legal payment? Do, do they even meet our objectives? What the hell is the scope? Uh, uh, just understanding everything about what we learn for the first definitely two years of law school here is applicable everywhere in the career world, whether it's Hollywood or other places. <laughs> or other they're all, it's, you know, they value the critical thinking. So it's just, you know, don't think that your life is shoehorned into a law firm. You ultimately potentially will be disappointed if you don't get that career path. They're going to just burn you up and spit you out. And then you're then looking at, well, I guess I want to be a sole you know, practitioner. That's tough too. So, you know, never let any, just don't go into the cattle shoot thinking when you're taking the bar, well, now I got to find a job in a law firm when you're doing resumes. So anyways, that probably took up too much time. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I actually want to say a little, a little shout out too. Um, don't think, I, I always say like, if you want to do business or any other law, I even say this to my students, you should take at least the federal taxation because I think federal taxation is the basis of every law you're going to be involved in. I think the only law, the only law I can think of that tax wouldn't be involved in would be criminal law um, because whether it's property, family law, which people don't realize, um, business law, of course, um, there's, it touches every aspect, and I think to be a good lawyer, you need to let your clients know they're either going to be taxed on this or not. And I think a lot of, even in slip and fall cases, certain areas are taxed, certain areas aren't. And a lot of clients think, oh, well, I'm getting a windfall, I'm just going to get this money and take it home. No, there's a portion that you have to pay the piper for. So, um, and I think that, that having a tax class is the basis really for anything, not just even in business as well. And even one further, the, the business planning course that Professor Santoro taught was also one of the most comprehensive and all-inclusive of everything. Right. Uh, you know, every day, you know, from the start, you're like, all right, here's the uh, hypothetical concept of a business. What do you do? Whether it's you're forming a, a corporation, an LLC, a, a general partnership, and, you know, every morning. This is like a, lob, a lobster pot. Easy to put your money in, hard to get your money out. You know, every, day, every day. Jesus, it's a lobster pot. And, uh, and, uh, but but that, that whole thing, we went through liability, went through payroll, went through FICA, and everything. And you're sitting there and your head's exploding. You're like, how do I even form a company in this world of, of American regulations and government and, and try to make a profit? And so both of those, I think, if, if you're an attorney, uh, any type of finance, taxation, and more importantly, if you're actually thinking of not being a formal law firm, you know, person, uh, some business planning, so that you have that ability to, when a client comes to you, if you can explain, like, why, what, what's your goal, like Corey was saying, well, what is your objective so that I know how to best uh, represent you, so.
I, just something to touch on that you said. I, you know, as a practicing tax lawyer, saying that it affects every area of law. I mean, it does. And are there any family law lawyers in here, or anyone teach? We don't have family. Oh, all right, good. So I can make fun of them. <laughs> they are the biggest committers of malpractice I see <laughs> for tax law. You're gonna go there. Ooh. I get so many calls What's in from universe? family law lawyers talking about alimony and child support and and property distribution, 401k, trying to divide it up. It's just, you've got to have a basic understanding of taxation in any area of the law. So, if you're mad at me, you're mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> I got stuck in a sub pot um, <laughs> yes, yes. while Jim was talking to. Um, I, I, I have to pause and note that uh, it, it's interesting that the better part of this panel actually is now down the teaching path as well as following in all these other footsteps. And I can't help but notice that um, Liz has clearly learned from uh, Tony's methodology because as you heard repeatedly that there was a pattern to his behavior. I was like, just take federal income tax. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yes. Then it's try another one. And then, let yep. me tell you about this LLM program, right? Yep. So you're, yes. I like that you're laying the, the same groundwork as Definitely. well. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so switching from alternate career paths Paths, to the law firm career paths, uh, I think it would be helpful for uh, students in particular to hear about how law firms is evo have evolved, uh, how law firms are uh, like a business even though we don't always think about it that way necessarily, how has the partnership track changed. So go back to Corey and Corey and ask them if they would talk to us about law firms, how they're changing and what should uh, students know about the law firms of today and what you might see for the law firms of tomorrow. To you. No, okay. <laughs> sure. So uh, I've worked at a large law firm, and now I'm one of the partners at a smaller law firm that has eight lawyers. There are three partners, and I think the big law firms they've changed in that they've created kind of different classes of, of partners, and that you have the equity partners, and then you have what they call income partners or what I call fake partners. <laughs> so they've got, the, they've got the different classes, but they've, they've done it in a way that it's still the same model in the sense that it's about dollars in the door. You've got to be able to bring money in the door to get up to the equity level. And if you're not, I mean, it's not it's your career, just you're not gonna reach that level. You can make a good living, be a successful lawyer, and you can be a great lawyer. But I always say, you know, to be a successful lawyer, you really need one of two things, and to be a great lawyer, you're gonna have two. I mean, you've gotta be able to do the work because the clients come to you with problems and they want them solved, and you've gotta be great at your lawyering, and you gotta be able to bring money in the door. So if you can do one of those two things, you'll be fine. If you can do both of them, then you'll be very successful in your career as a lawyer. Most people can only do one of them, and, and so those people, you know, they're fine, they're successful, and you see a lot of lawyers who just bring money in, but they don't really practice as much anymore. Uh, they, they're just, they're kind of, their job is to bring clients in, bring revenue in, because it's a, the bottom line is it's a business. And the, it's shifted from where, you know, probably it used to be more considered a profession, where today it's a business. And it's run like a business, and I would say, I've been, you know, graduated in 2006, so as I have moved along in my career, I started out as an associate, and you just, like, you go to work, you get a paycheck. I mean, that was the bottom line. I mean, you just, you did your work, and you, you were billing, and, and hopefully collecting, the law firm was collecting. But then as you kind of move up, and you see, okay, well, this is a business, we've got people to pay, and you have overhead, and you have all this stuff that goes along with that, and you know, worried about keeping the lights on, and, and meeting payroll, and all that good stuff. And then as you kind of become an owner, you look at it, all that becomes even more important because you're the last one to get paid. So you, you've got to run it like a business. And I think that's one of the things is I've kind of talked to other lawyers. It's shifted from more of the profession to the business component and, and running it like that. And, you know, you still, I mean, it's still a profession, but it's, it's, it's pushed over to that side. And, uh, you know, that's been my experience and working at a big firm too, it's just, you know, I left because I didn't, I couldn't stand the politics and the bureaucracy of the, you know, you got a management committee, and I'm like, oh my God, this is like, it's like, someone would say, it's like a cruise ship to get anything done, it just turns slowly, you know, it was, it was impossible to make any changes and doing, 
and, and to kind of do anything with the firm, it just you, know, you go to the management committee, and then you had to go to the partners, and so it was just you know, it was two years before anything changed. Where you go to a smaller place, it's much more yeah, much more control. It's a little bit more family oriented, and hopefully Catherine's happy at the firm. Yeah, so she, she's one of our great lawyers. That does a great job. So that's that's been my experience. No, I, I agree. I think I'll add a little historical context here. Uh, you know, going way back, I was fortunate enough in my time here to do the law program in London, where I actually was with a barrister for a month and a half or something like that. And going back to the profession, I mean, I remember I actually put robes on and a wig at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't supposed to. Um, the barrister told me to. Um, they had a little pouch on the back, and I said, heck is this little pouch on the back of the robes for? It's because you couldn't touch the money as a barrister, so they would tuck the fee into your pouch. And it, it was more of a profession. They didn't even negotiate their own fees. They actually had an outside party negotiate fees. So I think up until recently, it was viewed as a profession. It's just a historical part of the industry. Um, I point to the financial crisis as a major tipping point. Um, I think for a lot of us, we graduated in honor around that time. Um, what you saw between 07 and 09 is big AMLA 100, and I point them out because we kind of look to them as the exemplary party in any law practice. Uh, they gutted their mid-range associates, mm -hmm. I mean, large layoffs. It creates two issues. One, who is the next generation to support the outgoing partners and sustain the business? You have basically no one for a five-year stretch. The other part that I think of is it changes the roles, and Corey alluded to, people are more functional now at law firms. Um, the partnership role now is a client relationship management role. You have to have two skill sets. You need to develop relationships and you need to maintain revenue generating relationships to make partner at a big law firm. Real partner, not the fake partner. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a place for people who want to be non-partner track. They don't call it non-partner track, but if you're not revenue generating, you need to be a thought leader. You can do very well, very stimulating. But if your goal is partner, you're not going to practice long much. You're going to deal with people you're still going to ask the questions, find their objectives. You're going to lead a lot of things, but it's a different functional role. And I'm being harsh. I mean, it's a little more nuanced than this, but I think it's important to see. But um, what we're seeing now is around the time of the financial crisis, law firms were investing big in other aspects of law. So we talked about contracting, large scale review. A lot of firms invested heavily in large scale data centers, management review created a huge cost center they weren't passing through to the client. They, were, they thought they would build it in. Uh, the problem is, at that era, you were operating as silos under partners. Partners didn't share too frequently what their billable rate was. Partners, you had your rack rate, which everybody knew the high-end rate. You know, it's called $1,500 for a partner at an Amlon 100. They were billing much differently with their own clients. They wouldn't share that. They just shared the overall revenue number. No one looked into margins too much. Oh, that partner did great this year. He might have had a 20% margin, but he had X million in revenue. What you're seeing now is firms becoming more savvy. Um, there is a role I see growing. It has been growing for a while, which is like a legal operations officer. You see it both on the corporate side and in the law practice. Um, these are typically attorneys. They typically have some understanding of business organization, partnerships, and tax. Uh, they are kind of the conduit, bringing everybody together. So not only does a partner who wants to be a real partner have to be revenue generating, they have to add cross-functional value now. You can't just generate revenue to be one of the upper tier real partners. You have to bring value to other practices. And what practice have we discussed today that is connected with every practice? It's taxation. So if you were in position as a tax attorney, you can help a lot of people cross-functionally sell, cross-functionally deliver. So I think the key here is that there are business opportunities within law firms. That's one route. Legal operations officer is not a purely practicing role. Um, it can be a non-attorney as well. But also using that business savvy to be a cross-functional leader in a law firm is very important going. I think just to add to what Corey said is that one thing they kind of don't prepare you at law school for is 
that the practice of law is sale. I mean, the part of it is that clients just don't show up at your door. <laughs> I, I probably do 20 plus speaking seminars a year in front of CPAs who refer me work. I mean, that's mainly who I get my work from. It's CPAs who refer clients to me. And so all of that, you know, you don't think, hey, you're gonna, you know, I've got people who come, oh, I don't have any clients. I'm like, well, you're not gonna get any clients sitting behind the desk. You've got to get out there and meet people. You have to go to lunches. You have to do the teaching and the speaking and the writing and all of the stuff as a tax lawyer that you want people to refer business to you for. So it's, it's sales. Yeah, nobody wants to call it that, but it is. That's what it is. You know, it's sales, marketing. Practice development is the, the, wor the words they use at the large law firms to make it sound nice, but <laughs> that's what it is. I think the saying is that to build 40, you have to do 80. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the saying, especially with the smaller firms, you don't have a built-in practice development team of marketers. Um, there's two things I wanted to touch on, we had talked about on the call. Um, one of them being, there's more specialization too now. You know, as we see the actual practicing attorney pool shrink at big law firms, they are kind of specializing and what we're seeing is these people are actually leaving the big law firms, long tenured partners and creating high quality boutique firms that have AMLA 100 clients. It is a trend that's slowly creeping into the New York market, but our clients at my firm are law firms. I see our ultimate clients are corporate, or largely financial institutions. They are more increasingly going to these boutique firms because they know the people and the cost structure is different, the billable rate is different. So there is a trend towards the boutique. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree. They're, you have large practices at, at major law firms who leave and set up a boutique firm because it's just you can control costs, control overhead, and the financial crisis, which you alluded to, really showed that these companies, a lot of the large companies, they're still concerned about costs and what they pay for legal fees, and you can control that in a group. And you also, as go in the boutique group, you've seen law firms go away from the names. It's, you know, they'll call it like Morningstar Law or something. So you don't get in a fight, well, I want my name on the, the <laughs> masthead and all that stuff. So you, you see that kind of creeping in and it's more building something that's generational and not, you know, five different names on the... It's, a, it's an interesting question too. Consulting firms are creeping into the law space. And I think the quintessential example right now is I believe PwC just opened a... Um, it's organized separately, but it's part of PwC and DC. It's a group of internationally credentialed attorneys that are providing international legal advisory services in DC for cross-border. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> consulting firms across the globe are the largest employer of attorneys, period, mm -hmm. not law firms. Mm -hmm. Law firms, if you look at the US, I think there are maybe 30,000 pure law jobs opening up every year. It's not much. I um, think it lends to the kind of alternative legal career as a real option. Mm -hmm. But I think the point is, are law firms ethically going to be able to compete by getting into other businesses? Um, that's a question we haven't seen on that ethical side. You're not technically allowed to have another business. Mm -hmm. But as consulting firms impede on that space and take the revenue away from a non-pure legal standpoint, mm -hmm. a lot of law practices in pure law. Are we going to see law firms either disband further into boutiques or try to absorb some of that external legal practice? It's a question for the future. So for those of you who are in Rhode Island, uh, you may know, and for students, that trend that you're hearing where an entire practice group in a specialty area will leave to become a boutique, that is playing out in Rhode Island and as well, so it's not just in some of the bigger cities. Um, so uh, you also have the, the power of telepathy. My students have heard me on the business development soapbox a little bit. Uh, so part of the trend there, you're hearing that law firms are becoming more focused on business, and what we're really seeing is that business side is more important for every member of the law firm, more readily apparent throughout and not just when you get to that management level. And being able to start business development and marketing earlier on, uh, not necessarily bring in business on the first day, but to start developing those skills right away is a, it makes a big difference as you uh, move your way along. And the wonderful thing for those of us in tax, I'm sure you would agree, right? If you have a tax expertise and you can talk and explain like a normal human being to other people, right? You actually have a huge advantage on the marketing side. 
so switching uh, back a little bit uh, to the non-traditional career path, um, what sort of skills would you uh, suggest that students focus on and develop if they are interested in whether in the short term or the long term going down a non-traditional uh, legal path? And if you have any stories about um, skills that have been helpful to you, successes, failures, lessons, that would be great as well. And we'll ask uh, Liz and Jim to chime in on that topic. Let me start first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, skills that are essential moving forward uh, that are not uh, what we learn here or what we should retain here. Uh, Roger Williams does a great job in instilling just great loss, lawyer skills, but uh, keep your humor, keep your humanity, dignity of dealing with people. Uh, we can get into the fight and just, you know, whether you're in you know, moot court or you're doing all this stuff and we do our debates and it's about beating somebody or other stuff, uh, you know, that is that aspect of law and it's thrilling and exciting at times. Uh, but remember that, you know, generally in the real world, uh, it's about like connecting with people, you're selling yourself, uh, you're, you know, there is a humane side to law and it should be, you know, definitely expounded upon, definitely. Uh, uh, be proud to be that aspect of, of an attorney. Um, skills, I think it, we've heard all today is understanding some basic taxation or some basic business. Uh, no matter what aspect of law you're going to do, I guarantee you're going to have to see some financial statements come across you, whether it's family law, because you've got to figure out, you know, if there's a disbandment of some sort of uh, business entity due to a divorce or something, or wills and estate and trust. Uh, something's coming across your desk that's going to be a substantial financial statement. Uh, you better have a decent understanding of what's an asset, liability, what's real, debt, how is that even incurred, what's being carried for. Uh, so everyone should not, if you're scared of numbers, I think you're going to have a tough time being an attorney in the real world. Um, I would definitely say don't be afraid to say you don't know something. I wish I had talked to every attorney when I was like in my 3L that was already practicing here and saying I have no clue what the hell I'm doing and where the <laughs> hell I'm going. And I think that if any person ever comes up to me as a, as a, you know, a 3L, a 2L, you know, don't be ashamed of it. I'd be like, you're smart to come talk to me because I didn't know either. And, and we should be encouraging uh, practicing, you know, you know, aspiring attorneys, that it's okay not to know everything. Uh, even today, as you know, attorneys, we don't know everything. You know, that's why we have uh, experts everywhere. Everybody outsources because it's a little bit outside my comfort zone. I'm not really the best person for this, you know. And I'll hold your hand as I touch, you know, take you to a, a person I trust who's got that skill set. Uh, I think that's really critical. As some skills you should take with you as you practice law or don't practice law, but you move into. Uh, you know, the world. Uh, um, I think that, you know, in the end of the day, you just gotta be realistic about what might be out there for you and uh, be excited about facing that challenge. And I think that Roger Williams <coughs> is something that's gonna you know, give you a great platform, a stepping stone to get to wherever it is uh, you're, you know, you're gonna go. You should definitely have a one, three, five year plan uh, as scary as it sounds, because it does help to make the adjustment uh, easier and more tolerant to accept. Uh, change is the one thing that you should embrace, because it's going to happen to you in every aspect of your life, both as a human being, but also as an attorney. You, whatever you're doing right now is probably not going to be the exact same part of law that you're going to be doing a couple of years from now, potentially. I mean, Corey changed from a large firm to a, a boutique firm. That's called change. It might be scary. You take some risks. but as Attorneys, we learn risk assessment, critical thinking, you're weighing your options, you know what's an acceptable risk. Sorry if I downsize to a boutique firm and we work it harder, but my, my ROI is going to be greater. And I got some interesting past and some excitement to challenge me every day because that's ultimately what we're all looking for is what's my challenge? How am I going to keep my passion going? Where am I going in life? Uh, so these are the things that I would say in a non world that are thinking like, what are the skill sets? You've got your critical thinking, your professors are doing that, and this law firm does it for you every day in the crucible. Uh, but you also have that other aspect you've got to keep alive, which is your personal side and where you're going, because it's not the law firm's, the law school's role to also be your, your mom and dad or your, your mentor, you know, they're a mentor, but they're not here to say, look, you've got to keep these other personal skill sets uh, current and uh, successful. So.
Um, I think the biggest thing is networking. I mean, you're going to be networking from now until you retire. There's just no way around it. You can't be successful. You can't be uh, relevant if you don't go to um, a lot of networking events, functions. Uh, I mean, of course, you're going to have your CLEs. Um, I do. I actually teach CLEs now. Um, I mean, you have to get yourself involved. Get just always find things that you are not comfortable with and go after them. I think if you don't, if you stay, if you become complicit and you just get, you, you like your comfort zone, you like your little niche, that's all you're going to get. And you're not going to be successful. You're not going to, you have to keep growing, you have to keep changing because the law keeps growing and changing. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not in a vacuum. It is going to change with, as, as society changes, no matter what aspect of the law you're in. So you have to know the people that are in um, your area of law, know people that are in other areas of law. I mean, I'm, I'm still, <laughs> this is the funny thing, the friends that used to make fun of me for taking every tax class and every business class known to man, um, now come and call me. And they say, hey, I've got a client I can't, I, I can't, I can only get them this far. I don't understand business. I don't understand tax. So can you help me? And that's what we do. And that's why you stay in, in contact, you stay in networking, and because that helps. And it helps to know who's out there that can give you those, um, help your client. I mean, you're, you're going to keep the client if the client knows that, that you're going to get them the, the right people um, to help their problems. So I think really just networking and not being complicit is the best skill sets that you can have. Yeah, if I can jump in there and take it one step further, intelligent targeted networking, and I don't right. mean selling yourself in a targeted manner. I just mean <laughs> you are your brand. Every interaction you have should be based on a layer of authenticity, which inherently requires a little bit of integrity. And if you're not projecting integrity, you're getting no job, no work, you're just not developing a network, you're just there. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, I think I touched on it earlier, but Professor Santoro was helping us network while we were here and we were borrowing a lot of his credibility from the start. And I think it's important to heed that, I'm just gonna reiterate, to heed his example, <laughs> not just for yourself, but for all of us, because we are building a brand as a school every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are still young in the legal community, so it's very important that every interaction you have is authentic because you're reflecting on all of us. And I take that very seriously in the, what I do in the market. Um, and I think it's just, you know, touching on networking, it's so important to be honest, transparent. Everything you do cannot be veiled in some sort of hidden agenda. And the second thing is when you do this, never expect anything from anybody. You are not networking to get something. You are networking to introduce yourself, to build that image, and hoping someday you can help them or they can help you. But you are not expecting anything. You are very willing to give, but don't expect, and it will work much better in that way, because people can see right through the intention. No, it's very true. Uh, I think that uh, what Corey just said is uh, authentic and sincere. Uh, I didn't find myself ever when I was uh, uh, 3L and getting ready to graduate uh, that I would be an elected official running elections every four years and uh, I think that's true. Uh, we learned a lot here, integrity, uh, who you are and being focused on doing the right thing and that I think resonates whether it's with a client, it's with uh, other business partners, uh, whether you're uh, doing lectures with CPAs, etc. They'll see the sincerity, they'll see the, the, the actual person there and rely on it. And it's an amazing brand in so many different ways, uh, whether you're going door to door and asking somebody for their vote or uh, just, you know, like you said, making sure that uh, uh, you're doing the right thing every day. It, it's critical. And, and we learned a lot uh, from a great mentor who was that vision every day in front of the classroom. You can feel it. It emanates from But with all professors, I mean, whether uh, we did uh, evidence uh, with Professor Kogan and conflict, et cetera, that we do have some great mentors here at this school that you learn from. They're up there and you feel it uh, when they're telling you stuff and you're like, all right, how do I take this, incorporate it, not mimic it, because you gotta make it your own, and then bring it forward. Uh, I think that, Corey, uh, that was a very great way to kind of potentially end this uh, 
uh, thought. I would never think that when we're talking about business, we're really going to get to the ethical side. Of <laughs> but uh, really, in the end of the day, it is. It's about uh, that authenticity. That was just a, a mass of very concentrated wisdom. So for the students in the room who I hope recognized what they just heard, I'm gonna quickly recap some amazing lessons that we just heard and that'll give you all a second to think about your questions that you're gonna ask of our panel. Um, one, you, you were talking about the importance of asking questions and something we've talked about in the clinic because students very often just wanna know everything right away because they have a client in front of them. We talk about the benefit of inexperience as an advantage. The more you develop as an attorney, I'm sure uh, you've all had this experience, it can be harder to explain the down-to-earth right, concepts to someone who, to whom that is completely new. And that's something that is easier for a student because they remember what it was like to, to be in that person's shoes. I've seen plenty of rooms where there's a client completely missing something a senior partner was saying, and it's the younger associate in the room that is, is pointing out that disconnect. Um, personality is key. You don't need to check your personality at the door, and you shouldn't. There are plenty of lawyers out there, and people want to work with the people that they get along with really well, right? And honesty is an important part of that. Um, do stop and reflect, right? And, and after you get past that path where you know we get you into tax and you wake up one day with an LLM, do you stop and think about where you are and if you want to, to make a shift and pursue one of these uh, alternate paths. Uh, I'll say one more time, networking early on is key, and I think that theme of giving, right, and helping people is important, and the way that it's done in business and in law nowadays. I think getting uncomfortable is a wonderful lesson as well, and so do be sure to challenge yourself. Um, and that includes the Roger Williams community. So I think something unique about this school, and everyone's had this experience, you've heard it a little bit, is that the connections you build here continue after law school. I, I have a group text that's running all the time with my litigation friends who always have tax and transactional questions they can't answer. I should probably mute that because it's getting to be a little much. Um, <laughs> we talk about in the clinic as well the importance of knowing what's on the periphery of your practice area. So Liz, you talked about knowing how important it is to know other practices mm -hmm. as well as other non-legal concepts that touch what you do so you can navigate your clients to those other pieces and spot those issues so they're not missed. Um, and then finally, this didn't, we didn't intend this to sound like a tax commercial, but since it started <laughs> sounding that way, I'm just going to lean into it. Uh, the world is especially hungry for tax attorneys right now, so anybody who's, are in, who's in those classes and is enjoying it, it's a wonderful time to, to be in that field. All right, I will turn it over for questions. Any questions for any or all of our panel? We did a great now, job. The, um, <laughs> well, the better half of the panel is teaching, so if we agree to count participation, maybe that would help. <laughs> I, um, heard a lot about business orientation that you all um, were infected with, uh, our Professor Santoro. Uh, can you do business practice? I didn't hear anything talking about pro bono. Is that just the cases you don't collect on? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say that on the business side, we don't, the pro bono more, more comes from what Catherine does, the tax controversy work where you have clients who are struggling and helping them. I mean, my clients have money, so there's not really pro bono you do for them. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, the firm wow. does, <laughs> so the, but the firm does some pro bono work. I mean, it. The one thing you have to be careful of is getting wrapped up in a case that you can't get out of that takes a lot of time because we're eight lawyers. You know, we can't spend hundreds of hours on a case, a pro bono case. We just don't have the capacity to do it. But we do do it on the, the tax controversy side because a lot of those people are, you know, I think as some people said, you got to have empathy and, and dignity and these people are hurting. Some people, I said that. I think, yeah, Jim said that. <laughs> I, I can address this, I think, more from the corporate perspective. We always talk about when I have our administrative discussions between our admin team, HR, CFO, uh, we don't do pro bono per se. We're just a different organization. But we talk about building a culture of integrity all the time. And a big piece of that is time off for people to participate within the community. Uh, the hidden benefit of that is it's one of the best affinity networking tools you can possibly do. Um, I hate to state it in that manner because you should do it authentically, as we said. But I mean, I volunteer with a, uh, a an urban squash program in Harlem. It's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we help fundraise. We help 
actually give um, mentoring tutorials. We help with SAT prep. And through that network, strangely enough, I've met a, some of my closest friends in New York City. I've met some of my clients through that, strangely enough. And it wasn't because I was pursuing work. But I think the underlying intention is building that culture of caring, uh, being a member of the community, uh, not only for yourself, but the brand of the company is very important. And you will see legal benefits in your career pursuits. So uh, well, I was going to add one little thing. Bet you never thought it was going to be these two, especially that one making all the trouble today. <laughs> I, was, I was the cold, callous bastard during those years. Uh, uh, it's very interesting that uh, Professor Kogan asked that because uh, now when you uh, renew your registration for the New York Bar, uh, there is a multiple uh, question section about your pro bono work. Uh, not to be used or published, I don't even know what they're doing it for per se, but uh, uh, you know, there's exemptions, there's this and that, but they ask about work you do as a pro bono uh, and what you would value that at or how many cases. Uh, if you're not doing that, do you do a lot of charitable work and how would you value that as? And it's all encompassed in, this was the first year uh, that I had to deal with it because that's my cycle of renewal. Uh, but I was like, wow, and people are, are really uh, trying to, I wouldn't say push it, but they're trying to keep some track of it. And uh, even if it's not actual pro bono work for cases, uh, getting involved with, with just some community outreach. I set up a, uh, a veterans uh, kind of uh, experience called Weekend for Warriors, but I provide legal services for them for nothing. Uh, um, questions and answers. A lot of veterans, as they transition back to uh, civilian life, have a lot of issues. Some of it, unfortunately, is uh, PTSD. It could be you know, you know, drug uh, issues. It can be criminal problems as they get into it, or unfortunately, a high uh, degree of divorce. Uh, I, of course, don't touch family law, uh, but uh, you know, I help them in their transition and, and trying to make sure they're getting a good person to guide them. But there's a lot of ways we can do pro bono concepts without actually taking a case. Things to think about, you know, for attorneys going forward, uh, charitable work uh, and, uh, you know, setting up things that you're passionate about and you care about is a great way to do it in a, a non-official way. Uh, but uh, So that's something, but it's a very nice question. So. I can't help but comment on this, and I, I won't spend the hours, many of you know I will spend talking about how much more pro bono work transactional tax attorneys should be doing. I think the challenge that we see and something for students to pay attention to is it's harder for tax and transactional attorneys to see how they can provide pro bono service. It's not immediately obvious. I think the, the most obvious thing we see is helping a nonprofit organization, right? Um, and a, a lot of us who are in tax end up doing a lot of tax exemption work uh, for free. Um, but there certainly is a way to have a massive impact if you help smaller businesses and nonprofit organizations. And um, the, the benefits for you uh, theme to be continued. Uh, if you are to help a massive nonprofit who has a very complex structure like a massive for profit would, there's a lot of experience that you can get there as a younger associate doing that sort of work for free. Uh, and if you are not convinced, you can talk to any of my students in the Business Startup Clinic who are having a massive, massive economic impact in Rhode Island by providing free legal services. In fact, I have a brilliant student sitting right there who's going to be advising a brand new nonprofit starting up in Rhode Island uh, this coming <coughs> Tuesday. So we'll let them convince you if you're not convinced yet. Yeah, and I don't mean to just pick on family law lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the, in the, in the, we, we get, you know, we have all sorts of tax resources, uh, BNA checkpoint, and they, every day you get an email. And you see a lot of court decisions that deal with alimony and, and quadros and, and just mistakes. I mean, you would think, oh, I just have to draft this, but you have to look at the underlying code to see is it complying with the code. And, and so it's, it's common, but it's common in other practices too. Is this organization is another common area of misstep? Yeah. 
And I will open it up to the, the other people who are teaching as well. Uh, so I said it, I think Professor Santaro was the first person to teach me how to put it all together, and that's a lesson I very much enjoy teaching. And um, it, it should go without saying, but focusing on the client and what their goals are. So uh, it's uh, fairly common for uh, tax folks who are not focused on the client to give an absolutely brilliant high cost savings, but ultimately useless solution because it doesn't fit into the client's goals, right? So we are constantly focusing on where the client wants to be. So we could have two different clients in our clinic where the exact same set of laws apply in either situation, but the result is completely different because of that, uh, the two different people we have in front of us. You've had the same. Yeah, I, I mean, I've had the same thing. And, and what I try and teach my students, and I taught both law students and now business students, um, the approach. And, and understanding, I mean, when I, when I taught lawyers, I taught them to say, okay, if you are going to go in business, how do you approach a business person who doesn't understand the law? And for my business students, I say, okay, I'm a lawyer. You need to work with us whether you like it or not. Um, so you need to understand where we're coming from so we can understand where you're coming from. So it's that blend. The only way a successful business is going to take off is if they appreciate the law and the lawyers appreciate where the business needs to be. Because there are going to be times where the business really doesn't, it needs to go a certain way. And there's regulations, there's treaties, there's other issues that they have to deal with. And you have to figure out that analysis of, well, how do I make the business aspect thrive but be within the law at all times. So, and that's the, and it's, it's that bridge. It's that bridge for the lawyers to understand business and business to understand lawyers. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would uh, say un unabashedly proud that uh, you know we're. I was a class of two thousand six. Uh, it's definitely the best law school uh, year that came through here, uh, and. Uh, at that point, we had both uh, Dean Yo Logan, uh, Dean Yelnoski. Uh, the place was thriving, and we had a, a teacher, Professor Santoro, who got it, and he was encouraging us to embrace it too. We talked him into starting the business planning course, which was just an amazing course. And that one was the one where things like that, where you know, you got to talk to your client. They want to start a company. You've got to have them trust you. Like, what is your ultimate goal? Yeah, you want to make money. Do you have succession issues? Do you have trouble with your children? Is your wife going to leave you? Or do you have any bad <laughs> vices? I mean, you got to get in there and, you know, and, and, and so that you can help them to create this entity, which is their dream. And let's be honest, uh, whether it's a restaurant or a bar or, a, or you're selling a widget, a lot of them fail. And a lot of them fail because if you want to use the the mantra of house, everybody lies, you know? And, and so or you can't get it out of them because you've got to learn. And, and learning with, with Professor Santoro, that ability to, to get somebody to come in and, or accept you and say, all right, I'm going to give you my secrets and I'm going to trust you is, I think, something that uh, we were able to learn during those years here uh, when we were talking about business. Uh, we'd have our amazing little small classrooms uh, with a bunch of people that, you know, it was only about eight of us some of the times, uh, and you got to really have that amazing interaction with Professor Santoro that you would lose in federal taxation because it was such a big course, or all the other courses we took that were, you know, open up to so many different levels, whether you're a 1L or a 3L, you're doing it for your requirements or your electives and stuff like that, but it was those unique little, uh, you know, classes is like, you know, our own little private club. <laughs> yeah, I felt that way. It's like, yeah, we're going to talk about real interesting shit today. And, and, and it was. It was that. And, and I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, that, that Roger Williams, uh, you know, uh, allowed that to happen and percolate during our time because it made the difference for so many ways uh, for all of us. And uh, so that's kind of the lesson that I got. Be real, get people in, trust them. Uh, and, and help them achieve whatever it is they're trying to do, uh, and it goes so far. So It's a great way to wrap up and a good final lesson. I encourage my students at the start of the year, because most of them are 3Ls, to enjoy this last year, because it's a, a unique uh, experience to be able to sit in a classroom and discuss these issues. So as much as it sometimes seems like a stressful year, do take the time to enjoy it. And I think we are out of time, and I hope everyone will continue for the rest of the evening with us. Thank you.
Tony's just shouting over me, as he should. This is, this is your show. This is what happens when you let people drink in between events. It gets raucous. Um, so welcome to the formal ceremony in which we will dedicate the Professor Anthony J. Santoro classroom. Um, I, I did some welcomes earlier, but I, I, I want to welcome, um, give a special welcome to Anita Barr, um, who is here. Um, Anita uh, is the wife of our first uh, Associate Dean Gary Barr and a dear friend of Tony uh, and Pauline. She's been a, a, a great supporter of the law school uh, and of a memorial scholarship um, that uh, she established here in, in Gary's name. So, Anita, it's great to see you. Um, so, I guess we all knew this day was coming um, at some point, but I have to say it sort of snuck up on me. Uh, it doesn't seem like 25 years ago that I first met Tony for an interview in, in Washington where he used his superpowers to see in me what approximately 180 other law schools could not. Um, <laughs> from there, things sort of went downhill for a little while. Um, between that interview and arriving here uh, for uh, our first faculty meeting, I went to a retreat that was organized and, and hosted by Bruce Kogan. And while there, I almost killed Bruce and Jamie's dog. And for those of you who know them, you know that was a very bad thing. Um, the only bigger sin I think I could commit would have been to scratch one of Bruce's cars or <laughs> something like that. But I, I was not off to a great start. Um, and then when I arrived uh, to go to my first real faculty meeting where I would have the right to vote and you know, carry on and object and be obstreperous as faculty occasionally do, um, Tony quit. Um, and which to me, uh, and maybe I was you know, out of the loop, uh, was both uh, unexpected uh, and somewhat unsettling. Um, but he quit to become president of the university, which was a, which was a good thing. Um, and he was succeeded as dean. As you might imagine, uh, he had someone in the wings waiting to be approved by the faculty uh, who helped finish the job of getting accreditation uh, for the law school in the shortest possible time. Um, during his presidential years, we had less contact. Um, but one interaction uh, stands out. As, as many of you know, uh, the opening of the law school uh, corresponded with the resignation in October of 1993, um, not of Tony, but this time of the Chief Justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, uh, who was facing impeachment proceedings and criminal charges. And this was unfortunate, especially because uh, his predecessor had also been forced uh, to resign under a cloud just a few years before. So long story short, I had been asked by Common Cause Rhode Island to participate in uh, a judicial reform uh, movement and was about to write an op-ed that was critical of the status quo and the defenders of the status quo. And I was years from tenure, uh, and it dawned on me to ask Tony uh, to meet with me so I could get his advice um, about whether I should take this on. And he quickly agreed to see me. He listened to me, uh, he did not hesitate, and he quickly said, that's one of the reasons the law school is here. By all means, you have my support, do what you think is best. And judicial selection became uh, one of my long-lasting academic passions, but more importantly, uh, Tony showed me that day what it meant to stand up for academic freedom, which is not an easy thing to do when an institution is in its infancy, when it's trying to establish roots in unfamiliar terrain, uh, and where it's trying to win over um, not an insubstantial number of skeptics. So I could go on and on. Tony created the institution that has become my professional home, and Rhode Island has become my personal 
home. I was not comfortable saying this for a long time, but I am now out loud. My children are Rhode Islanders. Um, so I will always have a personal affection for Tony and for his work. But I want to say just a couple more things about Tony's character, about the things about Tony that bring us all here um, tonight. Before I became dean, I was for a time the associate dean for academic affairs, the chief cat herder. Uh, and Tony always said the same thing to me, and I, and I think my predecessors uh, and successors have had this experience. Uh, whenever I asked him about his teaching schedule, he said, I'll teach whatever you need, I'll teach it whenever you need it, just tell me what's best for you. And I'm not kidding. Um, I'm he always said that, and I can say with complete confidence that I never heard even a similar conversation, had a similar conversation <laughs> with another one of um, my colleagues. So <laughs> we know that Tony is generous, and we know that he is humble. Second. Uh, despite my many faults and despite the fact that I've been nominally in charge of his law school for over three years, he has never once done anything but support me. And I know he's there if I need him, uh, but he has never inserted himself. He is gracious and he is graceful. And finally, not for nothing, look at where his law school is today. We have successful alumni from across the country, people who came here as, as students with a dream, who are now pursuing it. Just this week, I was in the chambers of uh, Judge Roger e. Thompson in the First Circuit, and I was visiting three uh, of our alumni who are clerking uh, for Judge Thompson, uh, and each one of them uh, had previously clerked for a member of the Rhode Island Supreme Court. Uh, we have become Rhode Island's law school, which creates unparalleled opportunities for our students. We take this for granted here now, but also this week, the Esther Clark Moot Court competition uh, was held in the chamber of the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and our students argued before uh, the court. The following evening in Providence, we had uh, a mentoring reception uh, that was sponsored by two of our student groups, the Multicultural Law Students Association and the Alliance, which is our LGBTQ student organization. And there were almost 70 students, alumni, judges, non-RWU lawyers there to connect. This is a remarkable community that Tony has created. Uh, he had the vision, he had the talent, and he had the energy to make this happen. So put simply, I think nobody has done more for this law school than Tony Santoro. Nobody, full stop, as they say. And dedicating that classroom in his honor, the classroom where he used to teach tax to a full house at 8.30 in the morning when he was president, uh, seems like the least that we can do. So, Tony, thank you for everything. Um, <laughs> And it's now my pleasure to welcome uh, to the podium my longtime colleague, professor, dean, twice interim dean, and lived to tell the tale, um, Bruce Coven. Um, so looking around the room, uh, I see Tony's family. Uh, and I see friends, and I see students, and colleagues. Um, and other than his family and Anita, I think I probably know Tony the longest of anybody in the room other than family and Anita. 
Uh, I met Tony 35 years ago, probably this week or close to it, when he came to interview for the deanship at um, what was then the Delaware Law School of Widener University, now Widener University uh, School of Law, Delaware, where I was already a new faculty member. Uh, and um, so that was 35 years ago. Um, and it was a, a wise decision that my colleagues and I made at Widener to hire Tony as our, our dean because he proceeded for the next um, 10 years to lead that school in its upward trajectory. Um, and it was 25 years ago, probably again this week, when Tony, who was already in Rhode Island doing the preparatory work for the starting of this law school, called me up and said, um, you ought to come up here and take a look at you know, what we're trying to do up here. I think you know, this might be a good fit for you. And I came up and um, I'm very glad that Tony made that call and asked me to come up here. Because it gave me an opportunity to continue working with um, a colleague who I uh, love and respect and admire. Uh, Tony has had a marvelous career in law teaching, marvelous, almost 50 years of law teaching. Um, he, he has taught, I think, at, I was going to say every law school in the country, but that's not true. Um, I, then I should say he started as dean at every law school in the country. But, I, Tony has taught at probably six, I think, law schools and has been involved in founding at least four law schools, in addition to having been um, the consultant at many other, probably dozens of law schools and colleges and universities uh, have sought his guidance as they prepare to either start a law school or uh, start new programs. Um, but one of my you know, best recollections of Tony is um, because his first year as dean at Widener was 1983, and he taught tax, which I taught, because like Tony, I have an LLM in tax from Georgetown, and I was teaching tax back in the day before I got my mind straight and <laughs> stopped teaching tax. Um, and Tony was teaching um, I think it was business tax and business planning, you know, one of the one or the others in the fall of 1983, and I was teaching Fed tax and probably estate and gift tax or estate planning, something like that. And I um, asked Tony if I could come in and watch him teach. You know, I I was in my second year of full-time teaching, although I had taught as an adjunct for a little while before that. And Tony was, was then a good dozen or more years in, into teaching, maybe 15 years into, into law teaching. And um, watching Tony teach that class uh, in a pretty um, big, and it was very highly tiered classroom that we had at Widener, the big one, you know, was, was a pleasure. Just watching somebody who was clearly a gifted law teacher. And at his core, you know, at least what I've known over the last 35 years, Tony is a great law teacher. He's done a lot of other things. He's been involved with a lot of other organizations, a lot of community work. You know, he has um, chaired the Rhode Island Student Loan Authority for a long, had, had done that for a long time. Um, he created the MCLE system for Rhode Island out of whole cloth, you know, and I've been serving on the commission ever since he put me on the commission, you know, um, and that's a long time ago, 20 some, 24 years ago. Um, and, you know, he, he, he wisely married the beautiful Pauline Plant, you know, and um, has, you know, four beautiful children who I remember growing up as little kids 
you know, Lynn and AJ and Lauren and Annie. You know, I remember following them and, you know, as they progressed along. But at his core, you know, he's, he's a, a great law teacher who chose to teach tax and business law. Um, not an easy choice. You know, none of what we teach is easy to teach, but that's clearly kind of like um, if teaching law is like monopoly, then teaching tax law is like risk. You know, it's like a much more complicated game set. Uh, and, you know, that was a tough choice. Um, Tony's students, you can see from today's uh, panel discussion, adore him, and for good reason. Um, he is still, after almost five decades, excited when he walks into class. You know, he is still, you know, trying to figure out the, the next best way to get students to be just as excited about reorganizations and mergers and um, distributable net income and all of that. Um, and that is absolutely infectious. Um, so, you know, he has inspired generations of people who have gone on to contribute in many, many ways to their communities and to their clients. Um, among his colleagues, he has been the best friend we could have for the law school while he was the president of this law school. And he has been um, a terrific friend to me over all of these years. But it is a teacher. You know, he is a, a, an exemplary law teacher who, uh, who embodies uh, a a teaching philosophy that I've done a little bit of reading about over the years from a guy named um, uh, Parker Palmer, who, who has a book out, it's the title of which is, You Teach Who You Are, Not What You Know. And Tony has always done that. He has always demonstrated to his students his core value of wanting them to be as excited about the work and as excited about becoming the best lawyer they can be. So I join Michael, and I'm sure all of the rest of us, in saying thank you to Tony for what he has done for this law school on the dedication of the Professor Anthony J. Santoro classroom. Um, and I, I think it's appropriate that we recognize um, this man of substance who has definitely affected in the most positive way all of the rest of us. So um, I now will introduce my colleague, Louise Tights. I am honored to share this occasion Notice that I carefully said I am honored, I am not happy. I, like many of my colleagues, including Emily Sack, really are not happy that you're leaving, leaving Tony, and we are hoping that you will drive Pauline crazy and she will banish you back to the law school. So there's, there's, that, there's still that hope. Um, I want to talk about Tony Santoro, my boss, my colleague, my mentor, and my friend. I've now known Tony only for a quarter of a century, but that sounds like a long time. Um, I met Tony in July of 1992, right after he had become dean of Rhode Island's first law school. I am from Rhode Island, I'm from Newport, and I was home from Illinois for a family event and I arranged to meet Tony. Tony, who I'd learned uh, about from colleagues elsewhere, either was loved or hated. There was no middle ground. <laughs> Tony, whom I, Dean at Illinois, referred to as the Johnny Appleseed of law schools, 
Tony and I talked about Roger Williams and his vision, and I was really excited to be part of Rhode Island's first law school since I remembered as a child when even Brown had talked about one, but they never did it. We also commiserated about what it was like, or in my case, would be like, to move back home as grown adults and live with one's mother. <laughs> He, his was a typical Italian mother, mine was a typical Jewish mother, and I can assure you there is a great overlap of traits, <laughs> especially that one called guilt. Um, in the same conversation, by the way, he asked me, so how are you going to handle it when all these people that call you and want you to use pull Rhode Islanders to get into the law school, and these are all going to be friends of my first cousin at the time, who was a big Rhode Island politico. In fact, he helped indict the first, or rather impeach the first judge, Bella Lacqua. And I, I said, well, I don't think I know people. And he said, you'll never be on the admissions committee. That will solve it. And I have to say, in almost 25 years, that is the only committee I have never served on. So, my mother, by the way, adored Tony. He walked on water because he could do no wrong because he was the person who got me to come back to Rhode Island, and rightfully so. So, I signed up, and my former dean at Illinois warned me and said, you know, this is Johnny Appleseed. Tony might, Tony might come and you know, plant a few seeds and move on in five years. And I thought, nah, Tony is coming home to Fall River, Pauline is coming home to Tiverton, and I'm coming home to Newport. So I figured that he wouldn't just pack up and leave. And of course, my former dean wasn't totally off base because as Michael told you, at our first faculty meeting, he said, I'm leaving. The smoke has risen from the, from the chimney, the white smoke, and I'm about to be, and, and I, being a nice Jewish girl, didn't know the reference. Somebody had to explain it to me that this was the Pope. Um, then he was going to go across campus, and he said that we would get an opportunity to choose the dean the next time, but he was bringing in someone to get the job done temporarily, and five years later, we did get to choose our dean. Tony, my colleague. So Tony taught the basic tax course, as you heard, every year to our students, even while he was president and chancellor. He'd teach early. And he would leave early, and I would stalk his parking space. <laughs> and, I, and, and yes, parking was a problem even then, after year two. And I'd wait while he had his cigarette, and occasionally he'd have two. Um, but I was totally thrilled when he came back after being president and chancellor, and I was finally able to have him as my colleague, which I had expected on day one until we got that surprise. Um, I'm not going to say anything about his teaching because everybody else has said it, and the fact that so many of his former students come back and are here, and that that in itself, I think, is a testament to his teaching and his ability to inspire passion for learning in all things tax. I mean, that is not something that I could ever get passionate about. Um, as a colleague, you always knew where Tony stood. If he didn't agree, he would tell you, and he would tell you to his face, to your face rather, rather than talking about it to somebody else. I respected his, and do respect, his honesty and candidness, traits that are increasingly in short supply. And as the years has go have gone on, Tony and I have commiserated about changes in the legal education field, in the new generation, in technology, and Jim Galeb knows this. Tony and I, as fellow Luddites, 
are about as flustered by technology as we can be. And once you leave, I'm going to be the only one. So this is not good. At least now they say, oh, yes, Tony was down yesterday with this problem. <laughs> Tony, my mentor. Um, Tony has been my mentor, and he's been a mentor to most of my colleagues through the years. A mentor with whom you can share confidences and ask advice, and you know that it will never go outside of his office. In fact, he was the person I confided in and asked for advice when I was offered the appointment in, in The Hague. Tony also can be brutally honest. He will say, I think you're crazy to do this. He said that to me earlier this week. <laughs> but he will also offer support and advice once you've managed to create a mess because you didn't listen to his advice the first time. And he never says, I told you so. Um, and finally, I guess that best of all, Tony and Pauline are my friends. We've shared happy times and we've shared losses of colleagues like Gary and Esther. But we are all a family. In fact, I think that really is what Tony has created, a Roger Williams family. And it is impressive how Tony, when he was president, knew everyone. You heard one of his former students say that when she was an undergraduate, he knew her name. Um, but he knew everyone at Roger Williams. He knew everybody who worked here, who their kids were, how their families were doing, and he'd always ask that. And so, sort of the one story that to me captures who, who Tony is. One day I stopped by the dean's office. I was going to talk to Bruce. It was in one of his interim periods. And the office was being painted. And Tony was asking the worker who was painting it, so how's the family? And this seemed like a normal question he might ask any of the Roger Williams employees, his Roger Williams family. So I was totally surprised when Tony turned to me and say, said, oh, you know AJ, my son, right? <laughs> Tony treated those he worked with and those who worked for him with the respect and care that he showed his own son and his family. He started with a small family here at Roger Williams, and we've grown over the 25 years. The campus that you could cover in a 10-minute stroll in 1993 has become a university that now takes at least 30 minutes to cross or more. I probably walk much slower than I did in 93, too, but I guess the apple seeds that you put down have grown strong roots that many have built on. So we will miss you, Tony. And now, Tucker Wright from across the campus. Again, it's an honor to be asked to, uh, to speak here today. And um, <clears throat> I've known Tony for, for 25 years. Let me, let me tell you how it came about. Um, and I, I was proud and privileged to have a little something to do with the, setting up the law school. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, I was having coffee with President Sicaro from the university. And he was, uh, he was uh, talking about how he created a medical school where he was before. And I said to him, you know, we don't have a law school in Rhode Island. And his eyes opened up. <laughs> okay. And, um, and at the time, we had, a, we had a paralegal program, a criminal justice program, undergraduate. <clears throat> so he says, what do you do? What do you do? I said, well, you have to, what you have to do is form a feasibility study with the American Bar Association. And I said, right, let me give you an idea. Call Justice Weisberger. Right? And thank, thankfully, Justice Weisberger uh, agreed to, to, to share the committee. I was on the, on the feasibility committee. It met for 
close to two years. Uh, right at the beginning, <coughs> Tony was recommended to be the consultant uh, on the committee, and we worked diligently. We met many times. We had, uh, it was about a 12 or 13 member, member committee, <coughs> and he put together an excellent report uh, based on the, on the findings that we came up with. And um, uh, we, we had to meet with the Supreme Court of Rhode Island to, to give the presentation. And it was at that meeting that Ralph Pepito was there. Now, I know poor Ralph had his problems, but believe me, he was a driving force of this law school. Uh, and I said to him, where's the money going to come from? He said, don't worry about the money. You people get this approved by the Supreme Court, and we'll go. And uh, he, he got together uh, with, his, with his financial consultant, Mr. Gabelli, down in New York, and somehow or other <laughs> came up with the money and built this building uh, within budget, on time, right? Uh, and uh, the, uh, then, uh, you know, the <clears throat> they had decided to go ahead with the law school, so now they were seeking a dean. And um, I, I asked uh, President Sucuro, I said, did Tony Santoro apply? And he said, no. So I called him, I don't know if you remember this, <laughs> and I, I had done some research and realized they were from around here. And I said, uh, Tony, it's time you came home. And of course, <laughs> Humble Pie said, well, I shouldn't really apply because I was a consultant. I said, that doesn't matter. <laughs> right? So he applied, and, and, and that, that was history. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, especially Justice Weisberg, he did a great job in, in helping put, put the uh, whole th situation together. The, the advisory committee was a little interesting, too. We had a, we had a couple of um, developers on the committee, and one of them wanted to build a law school up, up, in the, up in a mill up in Providence, you know. And so we had to bring the ABA down and say, no, 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 no. We're gonna, you should build it on campus, which, which fortunately, fortunately happened. Uh, so the, uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the, the cons finally, you know, Tony agreed to, to be here from law school, and, and uh, we've had enough comments about his teaching abilities. I think it's experienced by the panel was here today, the quality of the students that, that went, went through your classroom. Um, I must say that uh, <laughs> I finally got the baddest, baddest compliment, best compliment in my life one day. We're having lunch uh, at, at, uh, with one of, his, one of the admissions lady, all right? And uh, he introduced to me, he said, this is Tucker Wright, he's the father of the law school. I, 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 Tony, you are the father of the law school. <laughs> okay, and uh, so, so uh, that's the end of my remarks. I'd like to introduce uh, President Farish from the university. Well, I have to confess that until today, I've actually never met Anthony. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is my first, first time um, in uh, meeting my, my predecessor, so that's not true. Um, but, but the point is, <laughs> we've had people talking about uh, knowing Tony Santoro for 25 years or 35 years. I've only known him since the time that I arrived. But I want to talk ab about him in a different context, uh, in his role as uh, the president of this university. Uh, you heard the story that um, back in, in 92, he was offered the job of dean, and it took him only just a few months, apparently, to impress the powers that be that he was being wasted as a dean. He needed to be the, <laughs> the president of the university, and he, he did that for the, between 1993 and 2000, and then he was actually the chancellor of the university for a year. I, 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 he may have been the only chancellor. I don't, I don't think that term of title has been used again. So. Uh, he is the first and the retiring tra chancellor of the university. But what was um, really quite remarkable, in addition to the fact that he founded the law school and all of the work that was involved in making that happen, he had quite a remarkable career as a president of this university. And, and one of the things that pr presidents, when they come to universities, always wanted to scout out first is how many retired presidents are still hanging around the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> 
uh, my last job I had two, and that was uh, it took a little extra work to watch where they were at any given moment. But but <laughs> on this university, just one, and and the the issue there is, is the president still acting like? He's pretty much still the president, and, and that makes life a little difficult. That is not who Tony Santoro is, and I think you could assume that to be true if you know him at all. Uh, he has been nothing but gracious and, and helpful. A few times that I've, I've wanted to speak with him about some issues that were historic in nature that I just need to get a little better understanding of, he was right there. But he has never uh, offered any hint of criticism or or anything that would sound like, well, I would have done it differently. That's just not in his nature. And I, I, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated that, Tony, because it's, it's a tough enough job coming in as a, as a new president where you're inheriting a culture and a whole um, bunch of folks who are pretty comfortable with each other. Um, but stepping aside as you did uh, was just made li my life a whole lot easier. Tony himself, as the president, as I look at what his accomplishments were, and I should tell you this, this story. I was at URI for four years, between the years 1979 and 83. And my brother-in-law at the time actually graduated from Roger Williams. And I remember it as being a very small place, which was true in 1983. Um, so coming back and seeing it uh, in 2011, I was taken aback by how much it had grown. And uh, as some of you know, I, I'm a lawyer myself, or at least I, I went to law school and passed the bar. I, I, I wouldn't really call myself a lawyer. Um, and I had always assumed that I would be at a school that had a law school, and I never was until I came back to Roger Williams. And because of Tony Santoro, I finally got to be at a place that has a law school. Of course, by now, I'd forgotten everything I ever knew about law, but at least symbolically, it was important. But the decision uh, to start a law school, I think, changed the trajectory of this institution. But it wasn't enough for Tony just to do that and hope for the best. Think of the things that he did while he was here. The Feinstein School of Arts and Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, came into being. The Gabelli School was renamed for, uh, for Mr. Gabelli. He started the honors program. We started bringing in international students. Um, there was a, a tremendous growth of the undergraduate population. He began the first graduate program. Uh, there was a, he, he acquired the, uh, the Metro Center in, in downtown Providence, which was an interesting way of kind of returning to our roots because that's where the school began back in 1956. And that Metro Center we've since uh, transformed into not the same building, but the whole idea of being a Providence campus is now manifest with our One Empire uh, uh, plaza building, which is a, a, an even larger version of, of how we're interfacing with the population of urban Rhode Island. My point is that presidents leave behind tangible legacies. And ideally, what happens is they're built in such a way that they become a foundation for the next president, so that we're not tearing things down in order to build. We're building on top of what was there. And I'll say that the work that Tony Santoro did as president created an enormously strong foundation for this university. So while I've had the pleasure of adding to the work that he did, it certainly wasn't in substitution for. And I think what happens as a consequence, universities just get stronger and better. So I want to thank you for having started that uh, work, Tony. I think you, as much as anybody, um, built the university, not just the law school, but built the university that we are here celebrating today. Lots of help, of course, but the leadership came from you and the vision came from you. And, and the idea that this place had something singular to offer, uh, I think is very much, again, a continuing part of your legacy. I'm gonna tell a little story about, about Tony. He's, he would probably tell it himself, but you'll thank me for telling it, because I'll be shorter than he will. And so, um, <laughs> I know him that well. Uh, <laughs> it's always a pleasure hearing Tony. He's a wonderful raconteur. Um, but but uh, the story is that when he was down at Widener Law School, a telephone call came in, and a secretary came to him and said, Tony, your, your ship has come in. Malcolm Forbes is on the phone. And Tony said, Malcolm Forbes? This is remarkable for two reasons. One is, I didn't even know what 
that he knew that I existed. And the second is, he's dead. <laughs> so there was that issue. Um, well, it turns out, as luck would have it, there was another Malcolm Forbes. He just happened to be the provost at Roger Williams University offering Tony a job. And this was an enormous letdown that it wasn't the other Malcolm Forbes, but, but as a consolation prize, he agreed to take the, take the job. And so, Tony, it may be that your ship didn't come in when Malcolm Forbes called, but our ship did when you said, thanks, I'll take the job and come up to Roger Williams. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. And now a graduate from the first law school class and currently a member of uh, our law school board of directors, Steve McGuire. I'm going to channel Mr. Coughlin from the first group and say I'm a little freaked out right now. <laughs> I've been around uh, the law school for a long time and uh, holy smokes, you know, the panel that was here today, uh, the list of speakers that just went and uh, I kind of feel like I snuck in. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Dean Yelnoski for, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I was a little heartened when I sat next to uh, President Farris, and he also had notes, but show off that he is, he left them on the, on the desk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have my notes. And, uh, I remember giving my mother grief when I was 22 years old, and I had just come home from uh, an epic summer in California, living with some cousins and an aunt and uncle that I really didn't know. And I told my mother, how can you let 20 years go by? And you only saw your sister a couple of times. I only met these guys a few times. How do you do that? You know, and she looked at you like your mother looks at you and says, uh, it goes by fast and you don't even know what's happening. You'll see. You know, so here we are, 24 years and two months after a hot blue sky day in August that seems like yesterday. I was uh, <laughs> coming down Medicom Avenue listening to President Santoro talking to Arlene Violet on the radio <laughs> about this new law school, how exciting it was that they were finally coming, students finally coming. You know. And it was about two weeks after that, I brought a visual aid, but I left it on the uh, desk, you can see it later. Uh, we had a picnic and a softball game, and it's uh, on the cover of the Rhode Island, what was it, the Journal's Rhode Islander magazine. And if you see in the picture, there's no grass in front of the school yet even. We were in the building, but there was still no grass, no trees or anything. And I was there with my uh, mother and my father and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and we were walking up to the building, and out comes President Santoro. And uh, I guess he was Dean Santoro still at that point. It was uh, probably two days before he quit. So. <laughs> but he came out, and he walked down the, uh, the, the cement paths were finally cement. They weren't planks anymore. And he walked down the cement path, and he gave one of his very dramatic, hey, Steve, how you doing? And he chatted with us for a minute. I introduced my parents. And then down the hill, he went to the next group to say hello. And uh, my wife, Laura, says, you know the dean? And I, maybe, maybe <laughs> it was Professor Worf who was just with us, who went in the same door that he came out. I don't know. But the point is, 
he made you feel special. He made you feel welcome. Um, I was one of the uh, non-traditional students in that first class. There were a bunch of us. There were, there were, uh, I turned 30 during my first set of exams. Uh, and there were differences, certainly, between the non-traditional students and the traditional students that were there, and young students, old students, you know. And uh, I remember one lady, a couple weeks into the class, classes, she was in her late 50s, and she was amazed. She loved the place. She said, just think, two weeks ago, the only thing I had to worry about was am I going to play bridge or golf? <laughs> but by the time the second year rolled around, young and old, traditional, non-traditional, uh, we could agree on one core principle. And that was 8 o'clock in the morning is a god-awful time to try to learn tax law. <laughs> You know. But when you're the president and you still fashion yourself a professor and you want to teach tax, that's when you do it. Um, tax was never going to be my thing. Uh, whether it was 8 in the morning or 8 at night, it was never going to be my thing. Uh, and in fact, as great as he is, the, really the only thing I ever learned from President Santoro is that you have to keep a dirty office. He said it during one of his... Uh, introductions here. You have to have a dirty office, a place where you can actually do your work and you don't have to clean up after yourself. <laughs> and I heard that you might be able to sneak a cigarette in there once in a while. <laughs> but I enjoyed uh, his class, even though it was tax, the way I enjoyed property, even though it was property, because of the teacher. You know, he was a great person, a great storyteller, a great uh, success, obviously. Uh, and between him and Dean Huber, they could tell stories that made even tax law, even property, bearable. <laughs> so, um, most, mostly, both of them were very good at, and are still good at, uh, name dropping. And the names they most often drop are the folks that were sitting at the table Today, he, he always talked about his students, you know. I've been hanging around the law school a long time, uh, maybe because I'm afraid they won't let me back in if I stop coming down here. But uh, I think it's that that inspires people, like Brian Ali, who uh, was the instigator for this lecture ser series, that, and the, the folks that uh, were here today. Uh, there is an actual reverence, sort of, for Professor Santoro. Um, everyone knows the history of the place. We've heard some of it, you know. Uh, if you were here in the beginning, you heard Mr. Pepito tell you the history of it several times. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was... <laughs> Maybe four or five times I <laughs> heard the history. And uh, even Jack Palance doing push ups couldn't shorten the history sometimes. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a good history, and it, it's a great history. And, you know, it, it's a tremendous credit to both President Santoro and Mr. Pepito that, that the school is even even here, because it was just a crazy idea for a long time. If you live in Rhode Island, you know it was just a crazy idea for a long time. You heard that it was going to happen, it wasn't going to happen, PC was going to do it, Brown was going to do it, nobody's going to do it, and then we did it. So, and if you've been around, you know his history, and this is the fourth one that he's been involved in, and uh, obviously, I think he did a good job at those other places, but he saved his best work, you know, for us. <clears throat> um, so today is, you know, time for recognition, finally. For, I've been here a long time, like the proverbial bad penny on, or the gum on your shoe, which means I've eaten a lot of fancy snacks and even a lobster once with President Santoro. And 
many of the other great people here, Dean, Dean Logan, uh, Dean, Dean Logan, Dean Kogan, <laughs> Professor Tights, and uh, Mike Yanoski. And if you see the picture later, um, I'm the only one who still looks the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, I, it was, it's interesting to hear all of the coming home parts of this story and because it's Rhode Island, you know, at all of these different events and the best two events that I've gotten to attend uh, are the last uh, two commencements where uh, uh, Dean Kogan and President Santoro uh, finally got a diploma from here. <laughs> so, and I got to meet both of their families and uh, as, uh, because it's Rhode Island, I worked with somebody who works with his daughter, you know. And uh, it's just been so great to see, see them both have a chance to uh, pat each other on the back for all the hard work that they did and the great work that they did. And uh, I think it's a tribute to their uh, friendship, the depth of their commitment to each other, that uh, I caught Mrs. Santoro weeping on the side of the tent as her husband was telling Bruce Kogan stories last year. So, as my mom said, it goes by fast and you don't even know it. So, I interviewed President Santoro for an article I wrote for the alumni magazine in honor of the 10th anniversary of the school, which apparently was 14 years ago. <laughs> and here's what we said back then. I said, people who know him thought he was crazy when they when they learned that the law school's founding dean and president, Anthony J. Santoro, was planning to retire and take on the comparatively sedentary life of a tax law professor. Everybody said I would hate it, he said, that I wouldn't have enough to do. But not only do I have plenty to do, I don't have any time to do it. <laughs> if I may be so bold, I'm gonna to try to teach you something about the three R's. And I'll do it in the form of an equation, so maybe you can understand this time. <laughs> Retirement equals rest plus relaxation. It's a prize, not a punishment. <laughs> so today is, today is payday, not only for him, but for me. Uh, as one of the 3,000... 160 graduates. Because <clears throat> I get to do what I always wanted to do and publicly say thank you. I give you President Santoro, <laughs> Professor Santoro, <laughs> Dean Santoro. sit down. Thank you very much. I, I, I really, I, I came prepared with a history of the law school. I thought I would be <laughs> spending some time here, but I don't think I'm going to uh, use it, and I don't think I will take very much of your time. This has been um, a very long program and one that I have enjoyed very, very much. They all lied, of course, but uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Seriously, I do want to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for all the speakers, for all of the very kind things that they said. And while I will accept their accolades, and I do very much appreciate Dr. Farish and Dean Yalnowski and the Board of Trustees of the University and the Board of Directors of the Law School for naming the classroom uh, after me or in my honor. In fact, it was my favorite classroom in those 8 o'clock, 8.30 uh, meetings. I, I just enjoyed that classroom. But the reality of all of this is that what was accomplished was actually accomplished by a whole bunch of people. Uh, we would not have the law school were it not for the vision of the Board of Trustees. We wouldn't have a law school were it not for the efforts of some 
very good friends of the university who formed three advisory committees. Remember, Tucker? Three advisory committees to uh, advise the university as to whether or not the law school should be established. One of those, of course, was chaired by uh, then Justice Weisberger, and they put enormous hours in. Uh, it's also true that uh, we would not have had the right to grant a degree if it weren't for the Rhode Island Board of Higher Education stepping in, thanks to the then Chairman Judge Leach. And of course, it's also a tiny band of faculty that came together to put together a library, a curriculum, and things of that sort. Uh, three of them are still here. Dean Kogan, Professor Tights, and of course, Dean Yelnowski. But they're getting rid of me, apparently. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. And there were, as a matter of fact, uh, others that joined us, and we, we remember them fondly. They've passed on. Dean Gary Barr, our first uh, academic associate dean, was mentioned. Uh, Dick Huber, the former dean at Boston College, came in to help us. And Ray Gallagher, my former professor at Georgetown Law School, came in to help us. And we remember them fondly because they played an important role in uh, what we do, or what we've started. But then, of course, there was Steve McGuire and a hearty band of law students who came and took the plunge at an unaccredited uh, law school, but we succeeded. Uh, we got the accreditation. Um, I, I have to correct a few things, though. Um, I, I wasn't dean when you came in. I had already been made president. <laughs> you had no dean. Uh, <laughs> I, I also have to, uh, Louise Tights probably disclosed this deep secret that I have held. The only reason I took the job as president and gave up the job as dean is, oh, I could move out of my mother's house. <laughs> I knew the president had a house. Okay? <laughs> so I took it. Um, in any event, uh, I was going to talk to you about Malcolm Forbes, but Dr. Farish took that over for me, so there's not much I can do about that, but it is a true story. Um, I have had a, a great deal of time to, this semester at least, to think about retirement. Uh, I've been cleaning out my office, um, sort of separating out my books and uh, cleaning out my files. I've been sending old files to various people. Um, People have told me what I'm going to do in retirement. I should take up golf. I should uh, take up photography. I should plant a garden. I should mow the lawn. Things that I've tried to avoid for 75 years, they want me to do now, okay? And what is this rest and relaxation, okay? Every time someone talked to me about retirement, my mind went to one single story about Justice Holmes that I remember reading about years and years and years ago. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, as you know, uh, was a justice of the Supreme Court and acting justice, acting chief justice for a while as well. Uh, but he was uh, on the bench until his late 80s or even 90 maybe. But apparently one day when he was pretty old and still on the bench, he apparently boarded a train at Union Station in Washington headed north. As soon as he got on the train, he went to the uh, parlor car, he took off his coat, he took off his uh, jacket, he sat down, he pulled some papers out from his briefcase, and he started poring over these papers. He was obviously engrossed in his work. The conductor, recognizing Justice uh, Holmes, didn't really want to bother him, but he needed to get Justice Holmes' ticket. So he waited a while, but then he decided to interrupt, and he said, excuse me, Your Honor, but may I please have your ticket? Well, Holmes fished into his uh, jacket pocket, his coat pocket, his vest pocket. He opened up his briefcase, couldn't find it at all. And the conductor, recognizing that uh, Justice Holmes was getting stressed out, uh, decided to say, don't worry about it, Justice Holmes. As a practical matter, when you sign it, just send it into the main office. Whereupon, Justice Holmes stood up, 
glared at the conductor and said, you dolt, I don't give a damn about your ticket. I just want to know where I'm going. <laughs> and that's the way I feel like now. <laughs> want to know where I'm going. In two weeks, I will be 50 years at the bar, 47 years as a uh, academic, as Bruce pointed out, 46 years as a husband. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. I'm not taking up golf, I'm not taking up photography, but I do have one big fear after the university has honored me in naming the classroom and bestowing upon me the rank, if you will, of President Emeritus and Professor Emeritus. I'm deathly afraid that after two months of feeding me breakfast and lunch, Pauline's going to make me Husband Emeritus. Uh, so, look, w without more, I, since the, the sun is over the yard arm in any event, so maybe we shouldn't go any further. But thank you very, very much for all of you who have been so instrumental in my having the best time of life during these last 25 years, especially the last few as faculty member. I really enjoyed the classroom, and I am so thrilled to have that classroom named after me. Thank you all. Appreciate it. So please, let's continue this celebration. We will be moving outside uh, into the atrium for uh, drinks and some food. At some point during uh, the next half hour, we will cut the ribbon on uh, what is now the Santoro uh, classroom. And if anyone is interested, at 7.30 or so, people will be uh, headed to Aden's. So please join us there as well. Thank you all very much. <laughs>